good morning and or good afternoon everybody uh, let me start with today to apologize for not being um presenting live um personal circumstances prevented me to come along i would like to thank the organizers to ask me to come and share some of the work i am doing in this area as you can see the, the presentations i'm going to make today is on the microbiome ecosystem functions and sustainable agriculture let's remind ourselves uh, the soil and the soil microbiomes what are the key ecosystem functions and services they provide for the human point of view one of the key ecosystem functions is a crop productions and the, and that is being influenced by a number of processes including the availability of plant nutrients uh, plant available nutrients uh, which is a link to in, enhance biological activity in the soils and increase uh, cation exchange capacity the other key functions is filtrations and the buffering um, soils is no one play one of the most important role is uh, filtering the water and buffering the water in the soils that is available for the plant uptake and as a result the primary productivity but also uh, um, buffering and, and filtering for the better groundwater which then ultimately supply back to the industry and provide the water for the agriculture the irrigations but also the drinking and other recreational purposes soils have a critical role in the climate regulations mainly through the emissions and mitigations or the absorptions consumptions of the greenhouse gas emission uh, greenhouse gas and all these functions are mainly carried out by the soil microbes but there are other uh, drivers of uh, the research in the microbiome, soil microbiome and the plant microbiome, including the requirement to increase the food productivity uh, productions by 50 to 70 percent by 2050. The another driver is that the farm productive productivity has been in a structural decline uh, since last few years. Um, particularly in the developed country, what that means, the additions of additional inputs, uh, the fertilizers or the pesticides does not result into proportions increasing the productivity. Agriculture is now being increasingly called for uh, to contribute towards climate change mitigations. There is have been a loss of agrochemicals and the plant breeding program in terms of productivity gain and there is negative impacts of the quality of the human health but there is i guess there is a two type of the rational one is a policy top down that where the in government and intergovernment organizations requires the sustainable productions but also the bottom ups where the consumers are demanding for the quality food but also the environmental protections so low use of agrochemicals particularly the pesticides uh, pesticides in in the agriculture for, uh, production system if you look at the all the analysis that has been done over the last couple of decades that where this uh, gain of productivity at the same time minimizes the environmental protections challenge can be made and comes from uh, two aspects, and this is a diagrams um, mainly produced by Professor Fuso Chang of Chinese Agriculture University in Beijing, where uh, they suggest that the increasing soil health alone can increase the farm productivity by 15 to 20 percent. And if, if we combine uh, that the soil health with the resource efficient crop varieties, then we can gain 20, 30 to 50 percent without further increase in the uh, resource input in the soils so it's contributing increasing the productivity without further damaging the our, our environment 
And I will argue that both of these requirements, soil health and resource efficient variety of crops, will require the explicit considerations of soil and the plant microbiome. Another the driver is that the microbial, microbial product is a, the, the market itself is a driver. If you look at the global perspective, the microbiome, microbiome contributions to the human economy, it sits around $1 trillion. And this does not include a lot of antibiotics that are mainly produced from the microbial communities. Then, if you look, just look for the agriculture uh, pro, agriculture products, um, it sits here. It is a biological product, it's not just a microbial product, but it's total biological product. It sits around today around five to six billion dollars. Out of that, the four billions are the um, the biopesticides. Out of half of that, more than half, sixty percent of that agriculture products are the microbial in nature. The microbial product in agriculture is expected to increase to 12 billion within the next five years. And so the increase in their value is 3.5 times faster than the chemical pesticides. Agrochemicals today sits very high in terms of the dollars. Its annual sales is around 250 billion. Out of that is 55 billion in the pesticides. And it is estimated that in the very near future, the microbial pesticides will be similar market size as the chemical pesticides. So the market itself are driving the research and innovation in this area. So in my presentations, what I'm going to uh, cover very briefly of three aspects, the soil microbial diversity, particularly focusing with what we call the most wanted list or the most dominant species globally, microbes, and what role they play in the ecosystem functions. So providing some evidence in this area. The second point then I will talk about the plant microbiome and sustainable agriculture. And the third, I will end my presentations with a few of the slides that talk about a global initiative that we launched to address some of the gaps and in the fundamental knowledge in the plant and soil microbiome that we need to be addressed in order to, to advance this discipline and advance this industry. So let us start with the first, which is uh, the dominant mi microbial communities. If you look at the, 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 the ecological, uh, you will see that I will use the words ecological principle uh, a lot in my presentations, all through these presentations. Um, because I believe that if there's ecological principle um, exists, that has to be unifying in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases. So if there is a ecological theory, it should be applicable across the different um, organisms. And from the plant ecology and the animal ecology, we have a good understanding that there's a hundreds and, uh, and, and thousands and hundreds and millions of species of plant and animals. But if you look at the global distributions, only few species really dominate globally. And we thought if this is the case in the plant and animal, you expect similar sort of uh, dominance in the microbial communities. This is a one study that is uh, carried out by the Manuel Delgado Macarizzo. He was in the postdoc, my lab now is a, a, a well-known scientist himself in the Spain, where we sampled across the globe. You can see that where the sampling has been done in the slides. And, and what we did is to look at the microbial communities, um, both the bacterial and the fungal communities, and measure all other aspects of the ecosystem property. That's where it comes from, is temperate forest or the tropical forest, boreal or subtropical agriculture or dryland and look at the multiple functions as well in those soils where those samples were collected. So the first things to look at is uh, there is there a dominant species of here in case it is a bacteria. And so we define the 
the dominant species, again, taking some knowledge from the plant ecology that is present in the most of the samples, so 75% and above number of samples. And um, it is, uh, it is uh, among the top 50 in terms of the relative abundance. What you see in the, this diagram below, there is only 2% of OTUs or um, uh, I guess um, a lot of people will care, sell at the general species level uh, resolutions. Only 2% of the total, which, which, is, which is equivalent to 551 phyllotypes, was at uh, the dominant microbial taxa across the globe. But on the right side, if you look at the same um, pie chart, you'll see that those 2% account for the 41% of the relative abundance of of the total bacterial community, giving the evidence of the, the uh, presence of the domin dominant bacterial uh, phylotype across the globe. We went on to see and look for the fungal um, um, dominant species. Again, you see there is only 0.1% that was dominant, uh, but they accounted for the 18% of relative abundance. And what that then allows this sort of analysis is to predict the distributions of this microbial community across the globe. And here on the right side, you see that for the fungal sort of things, uh, fungal communities, we predicted that this, this is where fungal species are distributed across the different ecosystems, the forest ecosystem across the globe, drylands, and the magic forest ecosystems. The other utility of this approach is, is to predict the um, economically important um, microbes. In this case, we look at the distributions of the soil-borne fungal pathogens response to global warming. And so what we do, is we look at the distributions of microbiomes across the globe, the soil-borne fungal pathogens, and we look at the, which are the key drivers. And what we find is two important factors, the moisture level and the soil temperature. And then we, we use the, the IPCC model to look at what will happen in 2035 and 2050 and projected what will be the distributions of those fungal pathogens. You see, this is Poma, Venturia, and Fusarium's well-known taxa in terms of the fungal pathogens. And you see that what you see the instantly, the most of the species, obviously the data here is only for three, but we've done a lot more analysis for like Alternaria, uh, Rhizoctinia, and so on and so forth. But what you see on the middle side of it, projected in 2050, you will see that the abundance of these organisms or plant pathogens will dramatically increase under the projected climate change in 2050. But these are the projections. These are the modeling. People always ask uh, that we need some experiment uh, evidence. So what we did that we took the samples uh, from the long-term climate change experiments and where we look at the control, which is ambient temperatures and, and the warming temperatures and look for using this times the qPCR to look for the abundance of these organisms. And uh, sorry, relative evidence of these organisms. And what you see that is consistent with our projection. In uh, almost in every case, the the abundance, relative abundance of these fungal uh, uh, pathogen uh, phylotypes was increased by at least a fold under the climate change within the ten years of the warming experiment. So that's the, that's the, the utility. So you can, this is just a soil borne fungal pathogens for the plant. You can do the same things for the bacterial pathogens, for the human pathogens and animal pathogens and so on. Second aspect is that one of the real questions have been in this, um, the microbial ecology is that because microbes are so diverse, if you lose some diversity, will have really have impact on the ecosystem functions. And the second question has always been the upscaling because micro, microbes are microscopic. So can that have impact on the ecosystems at the global level? And this is the study we done a lot earlier in the drawdown. 
And here you see that there's two sort of database. One is a dry land, global dry land, which come from the biocom experiments. And there's another database, which is the Scotland, where I was before I came to UK. And we'll look again the bacterial and fungal community, but also look for the 16 functions we measured. And then we take uh, the indices of that fifth, 16 measures into one measures, what we call the ecosystem multifunctionality. And so the, the so they did done by different methods. One of approach is averaging those functions into one indices. And this is a structure equation modeling that is done to link the microbial community. And, uh, and we chose these two uh, data sets again to define that if there is a relationship between microbial diversity ecosystem functions like other organisms, we know there is for the plant diversity ecosystem functions, um, then it has to be consistent against the, in the different eco ecosystems and types. And th these drylands and the Scotlands are really contrasting um, ecosystems. In fact, I would say the orange and apple dryland are really limited by soil carbon, high pH. Uh, it is a, 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 a very low carbon, but most of the Scotland soils have a very high rainfall, very high organic matter compositions, and very acidic soils. And in, and but you see in both these cases, ecosystem multifunctionality was directly linked by the microbial diversity. It is a, a almost 0.4 percent um, uh, variation is the ecosystem multifunctionality was explained by the microbial diversity in the dryland and similarly the ecosystem functions in the Scotland, saying that the impact of the relationship between microbial diversity ecosystem multifunctionality is a consistent irrespective of the, um, the ecosystem types. And after that, we have shown that in multiple ecosystems, including Australia, agricultural ecosystems, and so on and so forth, but also at all level, from microscopic level to the global level. So that was the relationship between ecosystem function and multifunctionality. The second part of my discussions today, or my talk today, is the agriculture microbiome. And as I said, there is a lot of demand for the to explicit considerations of the microbiome and development and harnessing of microbiome tools to increase uh, the uh, farm productivity to meet multiple uh, sustainable de development goals of the United Nations. And this is because we have very good understanding now that the soil and plant microbes play a very critical role, particularly the soil microbes in terms of the provision of the nutrients through the fixations, the nitrogen fixations and, uh, and, and, and nitrogen and phosphorus mineralizations and productions of the phytohormones, but also both the microbes uh, of the soils and the plant microbes um, play a crucial role in the plant defense against the pest and the pathogens. The other aspects is that they have it, I guess, so there is a lot of push, as I uh, discussed briefly, both from the policy point of view but also from the, the consumer demands. And this has resulted into a, some of the real, driven by some of the real translational success stories. Um, I guess you probably guys probably heard that, yeah, that the European Union's uh, Green Deal requires that 50% of the chemical pesticides and 30% of chemical fertilizers uh, to be uh, reduced in the use in agriculture by 20, 30, nine years from now today. And that probably will need to be replaced by, by the biological products or the microbial products. And this has then significantly driven the investment both by the government agencies, but also the multinational and the startup companies. And there is a, one, the real excitement is there. There's a lot of to be discovered in the microbiome tools in agriculture. For example, if you look at the human medicine, between 50 to 60% of human medicines have a natural origin, either for the plants or, I mean, and majority of them from, from the microbes. But if you look at the chemical pesticides we use today, is only 11% of pesticides have a natu uh, uh, natural origin. So there's a really 
a lot of things there that needs and are ready to be discovered and employed in the in the agriculture and that has driven uh, the microbiome in, uh, uh, industry in really a, an, uh, a a really accelerated growth from farm productivity to food uh, security uh, food security and quality of the food to human and environmental health it is one of the fastest growing industry in the world today but the use of uh, microbial inoculants in the agriculture is not new. We have been using for decades. In fact, rhizobiums have been used uh, a hundred, more than hundred years ago. Um, but the problem is the the efficacy of the microbial inoculants in the fields are inconsistent. It works in some uh, some ecosystems, some soil, some farm, but does not work in others. If you look at the product availability, there's a lack of uh, product diversity. If you look at in what is in the market today, it mainly comes in bacteria. It mainly comes from either from Bacillus genus or now some in the streptomyces. Um, otherwise, um, very few from other uh, bacterial uh, taxa. In fungi, it's a, uh, a trichoderma and um, um, and a couple of more, uh, but there is a limited number of the taxa that is being used either as a uh, growth promoters or as to control the pest and pathogen. The third thing is the sustaining the activity of microbes. Microbes aren't chemical, that you leave it and then and after a certain period of time going through. The formulations have, have to be such a way that microbes survive. This is a real constraint. And there are other factors that can influence the activities we did not talk about is the competitions and the desiccations, the fermentation, so on and so forth. But another example is there's is a lot of product in the market, but there's no regulatory agency in the regulatory framework to distinguish particularly what we call the plant good promoting microbes, to distinguish between genuine and the snake oil. And this then requires um, to have a better understanding of the plant microbiome assembly. Uh, I will talk about that in a minute, why. Why? One of the reasons is there is a significant knowledge gaps in the under fundamental and applied side of the plant microbiome interactions. Fundamental, I think we talk about that one of the things we do not understand the relations, equal relationship that our evolutionary process that determines the microbiome assembly, particularly in the plant root regions or inside the plant tissues. We have a very poor understanding of what are the healthy and unhealthy microbiomes. So we say there's a healthy soil, it is unhealthy soils, but we have no understanding what these means in terms of the microbiome. And, and any biological activities. Distinguishing correlations from the, uh, from the cows. And if you look at the another aspect that we have a little understanding is the microbiome beyond rhizosphere bacterial communities is very less known other than some of the AM fungal side of things. And both in the gut and microbiome, so just like in the animals, also in the plant. And another term is the applied research gaps. And which where in fact is that inoculant industry have been using this uh, organisms isolated from the microbes, fermented it, put a formulation, throw back in the soil, and expected that them to go, go, go. But these microbes is going into the a, a foreign environment, alien environment, and they need to compete with the indigenous microflora and have to able to utilize the resources that is being available. But to have a success, we need to understand the ecological requirement of those inoculants for the colonizations of the, the, the new environment. Unless we understand what are those ecological requirements, it will work in some area where the condition is favorable and it will fail in other area where condition is not favorable. We also need to understand the interplay between the introduced microbiota with the host genetics and immune systems, we have very good understanding in animal um, model, but also increasingly in the plant model, 
that the plant physiology and plant immune systems play a very important role, which microbes will be able to colonize its surface or inside the tissues. And, and we need to need understand better for the microbial inoculants to grow the plant, first thing it needs to do is to colonize the plants. And we need to understand how that uh, introduced microbes that interacts with the plant immune system. And there's other sort of things that can help going forward is one is the tools to manipulate the indigenous microflora. If you have a ability to switch on activities of some of the plant microbiome without introducing new microbes or just by providing some chemical signals, that can achieve a lot better results than other way around. So to address these issues, what we propose proposes is what we call the system-based approaches that looks into simultaneously look into two aspects. One is equal phylogenetic interactions between plant and microbes, but not with all microbes. So the, what we call the core microbiome, and the core micro or the keystone microbiota. And we defining the core microbiomes are those that are present in a particular plant species in all or most samples, irrespective of the uh, climate conditions, soil types, and uh, management practice put in, 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 in the perspective. And because these microbes are considered to be inherited, either vertically or have ability to attract those selective microbes wherever you grow them. So they are dominant in this at most of the environment. And if you put that plant, that plant specifically will attract the microbiome. So there is a mutual recognition between the plant and the, that those microbiota. And so if you target those microbiota as a bionicolin, then the chances of those microbiota to colonize the plant is significantly higher as a result your phenotype will increase. And we also say that there is a other aspect that need to look into the multidisciplinary research public partnerships and coordinated global approaches. But does the core microbiome exist? I'll there is now significant evidence is dirt. I'll just give you one example that we looked at in the, uh, in the sugarcane uh, across Australia. So we sample around 1600 kilometer radius where all the sugarcanes are grown. And we look at the leaf and the root and rajosphere core microbiota. This is just here example that if you look at there, there's only 0.2% of phyllotypes or OTUs um, are, are fit into that sugarcane microbiota, core microbiome. And if you look at the relative abundance of those 0.2% is 35%. So there's only few species or phyllotypes, sorry, that, that, are, that just um, satisfy the core microbiome definitions, but they are dominant. Um, and that goes both, both for fungi and bacteria, both in leaf and roots. One of the questions that people always ask, and, and then again, again, you're still talking about the hundreds of species, and then we use the network analysis to identify the, the hub microbiota. And what is the hub microbiota? Microbiota that is a link to most of other, um, aesthetically at least, most of the other species or the phyllotype of uh, um, uh, of that leaf or the root system. And we come back with the 12 species or, or phyllotypes of the microbes. There's always questions that what is this statistical analysis? And you can't have a cause and uh, uh, so you can, this is the correlations and you can't say this is have a role in the plant physiology. To test that, what we did, we take out one of the phyllotypes by using antibiotics and grow the plants. What you see here, you know, there's a 50% decline by just knocking out one of the hub microbiota from the um, um, sugarcane. That gives you the evidence. This microbiota is not there just as big because of statistical dominance, but it have a critical host function. And if you remove one, it have a direct consequences for health and fitness of the plant. So that's really exciting news, but I guess we need to, and as I said, that the one, one, another excitement comes from what we have understood in terms of the human microbiomes and how the human microbiome 
influence every aspect of the human health, including our um, uh, physiology, metabolism, uh, disease uh, progressions, uh, our behavior, and so on and so forth. Plant microbiome do the similar role, but our understanding of the plant microbiome is is very uh, limited in in comparison to the human microbiome. We have a little understanding beyond beyond the radiosphere microbiome, although the research is increasing to look at the interfetic microbiome. And, so and as I said, that the microbiome beyond a bacterial community, except for the EM fungi or a, uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, sorry, the microbial fungi is a limited, and we need to move beyond that. We look at the fungi, the whole fungi, but viruses and other things like protists, they also play an important role in the plant health. So moving forward, what we believe that we need to have a system-based approach, including predator and prey relationship, and the public-private partnerships for the research inception to market and the coordinated global approach, I think I said that before, approaches for the improved outcomes. And to address this particular questions, we have established what we call the global initiatives of the crop microbiome and sustainable agriculture. And the short term aim is to define the core uh, and how microbiota of these crops and what are the process that influences the colonizations of the rhizosphere and the plant endophytes and um, and, and, and and what are the, these, how these microbes then contribute to the overall performance of the plants and the yield. And the long term, of course, uh, uh, have a policy relevance in terms of the economic growth. It will create a new industry in the inoculations. It have a critical role in sustainability and biodiversity, climate mitigation, and so forth and so, uh, uh, and so forth. So what we are doing in this project, we have identified five crops that these are the wheat, rice, corn, potato, and cotton at the first instance. For each crop, we will sample 250 sites across the globe. And then we'll sample the rhizosphere and the bulk swaths, but also the natural sites of 250 sites. And then for each plant samples, we'll have a leaf, a stalk, and roots samples and then we will do the microbial analysis along with the uh, soil properties, soil functions, plant and nutritional properties, and plant traits, and so on. And this activity is already it's in the second year. Currently, we have 178 scientific groups from across the globe which, who have signed us to work with us and to drive this research. You see the distributions at this moment on the paper, it looks quite good. We, in fact, we already have received samples from the 27 countries, our target is 73. And we are working in a partnership with the multiple organizations, uh, including the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiatives uh, and the microbiome support and biodigits and agriculture microbiomes. I believe the Linda Lincoln is speaking in this uh, atmosphere. So with that, I would like to finish my presentations with the acknowledgement of the key people we have contributed to some of the data I presented today. On the top of the slides is my external collaborators comes from the USA and Europe particularly. And, and the bottom two lines is in the post of my PhD student of my lab who carried out most of this study. Thank you very much for your time and I wish you have a wonderful session of this symposium. Thank you.